Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. I want to welcome you back to the program again today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us every week at the same time. Uh, we teach a lot of series on this program, and I believe you're going to be blessed if you really want something more than just a surface uh, understanding of the Word of God, because we like to dig deep into some of these subjects. And one of the things that I so appreciate about being able to do television is that it gives me the opportunity to put in recorded form many of the things that I cannot teach sometimes when I'm on the road. As we travel, sometimes we have three or four services in locations, and we can share some things, but to be able to get the depth of what we're saying uh, in uh, some of those settings is almost impossible. But we are thankful for the television studio. We're thank you for we're thankful for our audience that watches every week and and uh, are watching not only the television program, but the good thing is is that everything uh, that we air to date is archived on our YouTube channel. It is also on our podcast on iTunes, and there is an RSS feed for your Android device. And once again, I mention it probably almost every week, but uh, there's so many people that are beginning to watch and listen that way. But the easiest way to find us and to find our channel is to go to our website, which you see on the screen. And in the upper right-hand corner, there are icons that will take you directly to uh, those, those uh, free services. While you're there, just subscribe to it and you get notifications every time we upload a new program or a new audio portion. I would also mention that we have a digital uh, message of the month club that you can go to our website and sign up for, and it has a lot of original content that uh, we don't have any other place, and it is included for your monthly subscription there. That one is subscription-based. So uh, you'll be blessed by that. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've been doing a series in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah that I'm calling Roadmap to Reformation. And I know that many of you are following that. And last week, I think we talked a great deal about the old gate. And what we're doing is we are going through the study of Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, were prophets that were contemporaries with these men as they rebuilt the city of Jerusalem and as they rebuilt the temple of God. Now what we're doing in this series is making a comparison to uh, the restoration that Jesus began as He was the Messiah that really led the real Reformation, and that Reformation was to bring about a new city of God, which is not a place it's a people. It's the bride, the Lamb's wife. We've, we, we've covered that quite a bit in this series and on this program. Uh, it is a removal from Babylon, and we shared with you back some time ago that the harlot city was apostate Jerusalem in Revelation. Uh, chapters, you know, runs through kind of 16, 17, 18, 19, up through there, because he says, in her was found the blood of all the martyred saints. Jesus clearly points his finger towards Jerusalem in Matthew 23 and says to them, you are those who killed the prophets and stoned them that were sent to you, that upon you, upon that generation would come the blood of all the prophets. So there was an exodus from that city which was called spiritual Babylon. In the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, they are having an exodus from exile as they are leaving Babylon. So what we're comparing that to is we are comparing this transition as moving from an old covenant to a new covenant. <clears throat> Back when we talked about uh, the Jerusalem uh, in Revelation, we also compared that with Galatians, the fourth chapter, that says these two women, talking about Hagar and Sarah, are two covenants. One of them uh, uh, is from Mount Sinai and corresponds to the natural Jerusalem, and the other is the Messianic kingdom of God. It's the uh, it's community of faith. It's the bride, the lamb's wife that we are a part of. It's those who are born by supernatural birth. It's a tale of two cities, Hagar and, and, and Sarah. 
One uh, of the seed was born by promise and one was a natural seed. But he clearly tells you in Galatians 4, you can go back and see that, that one of them is Old Covenant and the other is New Covenant. And what we are doing in this series is showing you that the roadmap to Reformation is leading us from an Old Covenant paradigm to a New Covenant paradigm, from slavery to sonship, from, uh, from, from exile to restoration, and the roadmap to Reformation. The patterns are so powerfully there as we've already showed you, we will show you again over the next couple of weeks as we start to deal with the Ephraim gate today, that as these prophets, especially with Zechariah, begin their uh, prophetic uh, encouragement to Ezra and Nehemiah and the people of God who are in the process of rebuilding, is that they, 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 they're speaking to that audience under, uh, you know, under uh, Babylonian reign as they are coming out. And then Cyrus, the Persian king, gives command to restore the building and through other kings as they uh, progress in the building of the, the, of the things of God. And as they begin to progress in that, you see these prophets, especially like Zechariah, who begins to speak encouragement to them. But in the midst of him speaking encouragement to them, he starts talking about the greater son of David, as he begins in his prophetic voice to, as it were, step out of that immediate moment and connect it to a greater reformation which would take place beginning with Christ and continuing down through our day, because I believe the city of God is still coming down from God out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. I want you to note it's coming down from God out of heaven because its purpose is to fill the earth with the glory and the splendor of God. It is the place that gives the omnipresent God a local uh, address. It is the bride, the Lamb's wife, and we know that the church is the bride, the Lamb's wife, and it is to ultimately produce a river that will create a flow out of a slain lamb that the river of life will produce a tree, and that tree will be on both sides of the river, and it will produce a tree that has leaves that will heal the nations. And I believe if there's ever a call of God in this hour it's for the people of God to arise as healing to the nations. And so as we begin to look at this, we are looking at this transition and this reformation out of an old covenant and into a new covenant. And as Zechariah begins to prophesy, he starts to give hints concerning the greater fulfillment of this reformation when he starts to say things like, there's a man whose name is called the branch who is going to come on the scene. And then he'll begin to talk about the cornerstone will be laid with shouts of grace, grace to it. We find that fulfillment in John gospel. I believe it is chapter one where he said, Moses gave you the law, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ and of his fullness of all we received in grace for grace. So the cornerstone was laid with shouts of grace, grace to it. That's the, that's the key sounding note of the new covenant is grace, grace. The mountain that we, I think we talked about this in a prior segment, the mountain that stands before us in the new covenant that must be removed is not just any mountain, it's Mount Sinai. And it's the law, it's moving again from the old covenant to the new covenant. And what will begin to bring change is not when we start shouting curse, curse, and doom, doom, and destruction, destruction, but when you start to declare grace, grace to a Jesus comes on the scene, and his first public message is from the book of Isaiah, and he says, go get me the book of Isaiah, and he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel, an announcement of good news. And he goes on to say, to declare the year of the favor of our God. Jesus came to shout grace, grace to the year of the favor of God because they had an opportunity yet for the favor of God. I don't want to take a long time again in, re in review, but let me just say this. You move a few chapters later, there's golden oil that's being poured from golden pipes, and those golden pipes are uh, the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, that it says it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. A few chapters later, you will see uh, it begin to declare, behold, your king comes to you, riding upon a colt, the foal of an ass, 
And, uh, uh, you know, he, he starts talking to them there concerning uh, the triumphal entry that you see Jesus do. Behold, your king comes to you. And that, of course, takes place on Palm Sunday. We're probably in the season right now when this airs of coming either into Palm Sunday or Easter Sunday. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the feast as we begin to unfold this next couple segments. You go a little bit further in Zechariah, and it says, What will you give me to buy me out of the covenant? And they weighed out for me 30 pieces of silver. Now we know that was fulfilled when Judas betrayed the Lord, and they purchased in the field of blood for 30 pieces of silver. In other words, I'm showing you these patterns to show you that the beginning of this building and reformation and restoration happened under a new high priest, in the Old Testament here under Ezra, Nehemiah, Zechariah, it was a priest by the name of Joshua. In the New Covenant, it's a priest after the name of Yeshua, or if you will, Jesus. Jesus is the equivalent of the name Joshua in the Old Testament. It is the Greek equivalent of the word Jesus. So Jesus becomes the leader or the priest of the New Covenant, and He begins to bring us into a greater Reformation. Now we want to go uh, today into Nehemiah because I want to talk about the Ephraim gate. Now the, one of the main things we're going to look at as we get into this is that they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles at the Ephraim gate. It's where they read the book of the law. However, in the New Test Covenant, Jesus was the fulfillment of the law to release us and to release to us the double portion blessing. The blessing of Abraham would come upon both Jew and Gentile through the promised seed of Abraham. He became a curse that we might receive the blessing. Now let me just go and, and read this uh, to you, and we'll get into it a little bit today and then over the next couple of weeks. In Nehemiah 8, chapter 8, verse number 9 through 18, it said, And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, literally the governor, I like that because Nehemiah's name means the comforter. So when you begin to understand that the Comforter, which is called the Holy Spirit, has become the governor of this city, that this city is not without government. Our lives, even though we're not under the law, is not, uh, is not lawless, but it's uh, operated and functions under the law of the Spirit of life. And uh, I, 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 there's so many things that hit me when I start talking about this, but uh, when I think about, again, the Holy Spirit becoming the governor, I've said this over and over again, but I believe it's worth repeating. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, delivered by the blood of a lamb, they're delivered by blood. They cross the Red Sea, they're delivered by water. When they come to the foot of Mount Sinai, 50 days after Passover, after the lamb was slain, they're at the foot of Mount Sinai, which would be equivalent to our season. The 50 days after Passover would be the Feast of Pentecost. It is in 50 days after they left Egypt that God gives them in the Old Testament the law. And when you get into the New Testament, exactly 50 days after Jesus is the true Lamb and He is sacrificed, they are in an upper room. It's 50 days later and the day of Pentecost has fully come. The word Pentecost means 50 because it was 50 days after the Lamb was slain. And this time, God doesn't give them the law. I call it rules on rocks. This time, God gave them the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit is to the new covenant what the law was to the old covenant. Under the old covenant, when God gave the law, 3,000 people dropped dead. In the new covenant, when God gave them the Holy Ghost, 3,000 people were added to the church. Why is that? Because under the old covenant, the letter kills in the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. So the governor is the Holy Spirit. I think that's awesome when we begin to understand that the, the restoration of this city, the governor of the city is the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm telling you, I think sometimes we miss the importance and the emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit is to do more than just give us a Pentecostal meeting and a jerk and uh, you know a shout and, and uh, speaking in tongues. I believe in all of that, but I believe that the Holy Spirit does a deeper work than just giving us an emotional buzz. Now let me move on. It says in Nehemiah, which is the governor of the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites taught the people and said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. 
for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the, our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people and said, Hold your peace, for the, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions to, to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. And on the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people and the priests and the Levites unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law which... Uh, in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month, which is the feast of booths or the feast of tabernacles. We're going to get into this a lot over the next couple of weeks. And that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mountain and fetch olive branches and palm branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches, and the branches of thick trees to make booths. As it is written, so the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, every one upon the roof of his house and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the street of the water gate and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. Now we're going to talk about the water gate and the Ephraim gate probably simultaneously here a little bit. But they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles uh, in the street of the water gate, and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. And all the congregation of them that were come out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Jeshua, the son of Nun, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so, and there was very great gladness. Also day by day, from the first day unto the last, he read in the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according to the manner. Now, they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles on the, at, the, at, the, at the water gate and at the gate of Ephraim. Now, what I want to talk about first of all here is that the, the name Ephraim means uh, to be doubly fruitful or double portion. Now, what we're going to do is show you something here. When they came into the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles was preceded by the great Day of Atonement, and it was a time of afflicting of the soul. It was literally a time of great repentance. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I think there's so much could be said concerning repentance, but I think we've made so much to do uh, you know, when we start to focus on uh, just repenting from sin, and I believe that's absolutely a part of it. But I believe that when he talks about repentance, especially in the New Covenant, the word repentance does not just simply mean you need to get saved every week. It is the Greek word metanoia, and it means literally to change the way you think. In my book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, especially it's on the table here, and we're about to release a second edition before long, so you may want to hold before you order this book. But uh, we're about to release a second edition on that book. But in, the, in that book, we talk about uh, to the seven churches which were in Asia that they needed to change the way they think or they needed to repent. And everything he tells that church to repent of would be what would catapult them into a new covenant understanding. In other words, he tells them at the church at Ephesus, he says, uh, I have someone against you because you have them there that say they're apostles and they're not, and you have worked and labored and you've labored and worked, and uh, you know, and uh, they've taught, basically they've taught you works and labor. But he tells that church, he says, listen, uh, you know, you've tried them that say they're apostles, found them to be liars. But he said, to him that overcometh, I'll grant him. He said, remember whence from whence thou art fallen. 
and do the first works over, else I'll come unto thee and fight against you with the sword of my mouth. To him that overcome, I'll give him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And what he's rebuking that first church for is false apostles who are teaching works and labor in order to access the life of God. When he says, remember from whence thou art fallen, he's not telling them, to remember where they fell from Saturday night. He's trying to tell them, remember what caused the original fall was when you ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil is a picture of the law because by the law is the knowledge of sin. And he's trying to talk about righteousness. The whole New Testament, folks, pretty much is written to get you to move from a righteousness based on the works of the law into a righteousness by faith. Read Galatians 3 and 4, especially as it relates to Abraham, who was righteous outside without the works of the law. And so uh, he's telling them to move away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and if you overcome, I'll give you to eat of the tree of life. So he's talking about repenting and changing the way you think and moving uh, to uh, the tree of life. He, uh, I could go through all of I don't want to go through all of those, but I will go to even the last one. But he says to them at the church at La Laodicea, he said, I would that you were hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and will open to me, I, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And uh, to him that overcomes, I'll grant him to sit with me in my throne, even as I'm overcoming him, sit down with my father in his throne. So he tells that church, I want you to be hot or cold. I think you could literally take that and say, I'd rather you were either old covenant or new covenant, but don't make it a mixture of both because Paul calls the mixture of law and grace a perversion of the gospel. And then he goes on to say that what you need to do is, he said, I stand at the door and knock. If you open, I'll come in and sup with you. The, that the idea there is to sup with him is to eat the covenant meal, uh, the covenant meal that Jesus ate with his disciples the night before his decease was the Passover meal in an upper room because it was the inauguration of a new covenant. He's trying to get the church at Laodicea to begin to make the transition to feed on the covenant meal that says, this is my body that was broken for you. That's the afflicting of the soul and the repentance that needs to take place is that Jesus has paid the price for you. And then he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice, open the door. I will come into him, will sup with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I'll grant him to sit with me in my throne. Then the, the fourth chapter of Revelation opens says, After this I saw a door open. It's the same door he was knocking on in chapter 4. That door has been opened into the heavens, and there's an invitation to a throne. Those are terminologies that are highly symbolic of an invitation to sit with him in his throne and to rule and to reign in the kingdom of God. That's not out in the distant future. It was on the scene when John said, repent. See, here's another word, repent. Here's an afflicting the soul. He said, repent, change the way you think the kingdom is at hand. John the Baptist said that to a first century church right there on the bank of the Jordan River because Jesus was about to come down over the bank of the river. He said, right there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's the repentance that I believe and the afflicting of the soul that we need to do that once you begin to understand that, there's great celebration that happens in the Feast of Tabernacles right after the solemn, solemn feast. Is It's like it shifts the whole atmosphere from mourning and sorrow to a place of celebration and feasting. When the fourth chapter of Revelation opens, there's a throne set and there's a rainbow around the throne. You've heard me talk about this before. The rainbow is a symbol of a covenant. Well, how you know, Brother House? Because the book of Genesis talks about when God brought Noah into a new world, he put a bow in the cloud and said, this is the token of my covenant that I will never be wroth or angry with you again, nor will I smite the earth with a flood again. And so it is the promise of a better covenant based on better promises. So as they, in the old covenant, as Ezra read the law, the people began to weep. But one of the things we're going to see, and I'm just going to be able to just introduce this in this segment and then go to the next one. But when you see Zechariah 
he starts to talk about this, and he says uh, in uh, Zechariah 9, verse number 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Jesus fulfilled this on Palm Sunday. And he said, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. I want you to see, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. The Ephraim gate is where they celebrated this feast. Now I want you to see this. And the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. And as for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant have I set forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. Turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope, even this day do I declare that I will render unto thee double. And when I have bent Judah, when I have bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up thy sons against O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as a sword of a mighty man, and the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the trumpet, and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts shall defend them, and they shall devour and subdue with sling stones, and they shall drink and make a noise as through wine, and they shall be filled like bowls and, and as the corners of the altar. And the Lord their God shall save them in, the day, in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon this land. For how great is the good, his goodness and his great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful and new wine the maids. He's talking about uh, uh, Ephraim. I'm going to cut off the chariot from Ephraim and I'm going to bend the, fill the bow with Ephraim. Now the word Ephraim means doubly fruitful or double portion. He tells them when the daughter of Zion would come riding upon a colt, the foal of an ass, he would re render unto them double uh, for uh, all of their trouble. In other words, he's, what, you, what I want you to see is that when Jesus came as the Savior, he received double for our trouble. When He was crucified, we were crucified. He received double so that He could release the blessing and release the flow of the Feast of Tabernacles that when we afflict our soul with what Jesus has already done in His death, His burial, and His resurrection, our days of atonement and suffering are over and it's time to move into the Ephraim gate for a time of rejoicing. Well, we're out of time and we're going to pick this up again next week. We do need your help to stay on the air, so if you'd like to a seed into this ministry, please call the number on the screen. If you don't get an answer, leave a message. Someone will return your call. The easiest way to do it is to go to our website. You see it on the screen and give a, a, a donation via PayPal or your credit card or to send a check or money order to the address that will come on the screen. Why don't you do that today? We appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.